next on our agenda, we're going to move right on to it. Uh, looks like we're uh, doing good on schedule. And I'm going to invite the panel on renewable energy and resources to come on up and sit down, and we'll uh, have you introduced. He's not? Okay, so there's two. Okay. So we're ready to start. Um, as you'll notice, most of the panelists here are from around the country. We want to hear what they have to say. But uh, in order to put the Hobbs flavor on that, we're going to have our uh, local dignitaries introduce the panels. Uh, the first one today is a good friend of mine, Gary Dill. He's the president of the University of the Southwest. Gary? It is my honor to introduce our first distinguished panel. As you can see in the program, there are four throughout the day. Of this first panel, one member was prevented from being here by unforeseeable circumstances. So we're going to, uh, going to rely on the other two distinguished members to, uh, to lead us through this entire discussion. We're talking during this first panel about um, renewable energy and the resources solar, wind, and geothermal. The first member of our panel, and I will not introduce these again, they will simply speak e each after the other, is Larry Flowers. He is National Technical Director of Wind Power in America and is a leader at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory Wind Technology Center in Golden, Colorado. He has been at NREL for over 20 years and held responsibilities in solar thermal, buildings, utility, industrial, international, and wind power applications. He has spent the last nine years in wind technology um, with an emphasis on village and international systems. He was assigned the WPA National Initiative Lead in October 1999. Prior to NREL, he worked in the aluminum industry and in manufacturing, applications engineering and marketing. He has degrees in engineering and business administration. The second member of the panel is David Eaves, president and CEO of Southwestern Public Service Company, SPS, and Excel Energy Company. He also serves as a director of SPS. He most recently served as vice president of resource planning and acquisition for Excel Energy, where his primary functions included long-term resource planning, competitive acquisition of generation resources, negotiating and managing all long-term power purchase agreements, securing and managing the electric transmission access, and rights for native land load and wholesale markets, and planning and securing the gas transportation and storage services for gas businesses and for generation fuel. He did not write short sentences. <laughs> he is a director of the Association of Electric Companies of Texas. Mr. Eaves is active in a number of organizations, including the Boy Scouts and Cal Farley's Boys Ranch. It is an honor for me to introduce these two gentlemen to you today, and I look forward to benefiting from their uh, presentations to us. Good morning. So, so this is Hobbs, New Mexico, eh? I drove over from Midland, and I was a little concerned there for a while. I had a, a tire that was flat, going flat, and I said, okay, I'll just go to Eunice and get this thing fixed. And I got to the intersection. There's no town of Eunice. I mean, are, is anybody from Eunice here? Where is Eunice? <laughs> it wasn't at the intersection of my map, so I, I limped in last night, and I, I got here, so I'm happy to be here. You, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak on, uh, on wind energy, uh, Saying that I have more than 20 years uh, ex uh, experience at NREL is like saying I'm, I'm more than 50. So I've actually been there for 29 years, and I uh, spent the last 18 of those in um, in uh, in wind energy. Is, is this is this is this the presentation you're seeing here? Or are you just seeing me? 
can you can we start the presentation? Is it there? Ah, excellent. Now do I have a here we go. If I push this forward and the lights go out, that's not my fault. So I'm going to just I'm just going to bring you up to date on on where wind is uh, around the country. Of course, you guys uh, live right next to Texas, and uh, and Texas is number one in a lot of things, uh, not in any sports things, but but in a lot of things, uh, and, and 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 wind is one of them, and uh, we have good colleagues up at uh, Amarillo and up at uh, up Lubbock. Uh, who do have done lots of good uh, work in, in wind, and you, of course you have folks here in New Mexico as well at Sandia and Las Cruces who have done a lot of work in wind. So this is a this is a windy area and a lot of good expertise. So I'm just happy to uh, have been invited down here to talk to you about my one of my favorite subjects. And I push the wrong button, so I go. You're going to help me get back. Okay, I'm going to push the right button the next time I think. I have four choices. And so the, the chances are I'll get it right uh, eventually. This, this shows the, uh, the tremendous increase in wind energy uh, in our country over, over the years. And as you can see, the blue line is the cost of wind. Now, uh, my colleague here is from a utility, and he'll be the first to admit that uh, back in the early 80s when wind energy was uh, up there at 20 cents a kilowatt hour, there wasn't a lot of interest by the utilities in, in wind. But now that it's gotten down competitive with other new generation, other new generation, it's important to compare it to other new generation as opposed to uh, already installed and depreciated uh, capital equipment. It's fully competitive with, uh, with new coal and new gas. And up in Colorado, uh, the, where I'm from, where Excel uh, has a, main, a lot of uh, the main load up there, uh, wind is fully competitive with new gas and new coal facilities. As a result, you can see the wind has taken off. And last year, we built on the order of 8,000 megawatts. Now, I don't know if you guys deal in megawatts down here or kilowatts, but, but a megawatt basically is a million watts. And an, an individual turbine can be anywhere from a, a megawatt to three megawatts. And a, a megawatt of wind will supply about 250 homes. So that, just keep that in your mind. Uh, so when we talk about 8,000 megawatts, multiply that times 250 homes. And that's how many new home equivalents were electrified by wind last year. So you can see we're taking off, uh, and with that increase in the last two years, almost doubled the capacity in the U.S., we once again, the U.S. is the number one uh, wind generation country in the world. We uh, surpassed Germany after being uh, in the top five. We're now number one again. This is the worldwide uh, situation. As you can see, uh, while wind energy at utility scale really started in California in 1980, uh, frankly, Europe has taken, uh, had taken the lead for a number of years. That's, that's the yellow. And that's primarily not because of cost, but primarily because of policy. And today's uh, conference is on policy. Policy is a very important driver for wind energy, and in Europe, they gave very uh, uh, strong incentives to build wind and renewables. And as you can see, Europe's taken off. And they built a lot of facilities in Europe. Well, the, the problem with that is, as we began to take off then in, in this past decade, we were buying a lot of equipment from Germany and Denmark and Spain. And as the, as the dollar fell dramatically since around 2000, 2000, you could probably buy uh, almost a euro and a half with a dollar, and then just last year, just the opposite occurred. Uh, and so we are spending U.S. dollars for European developed equipment, and that was very, very expensive, and one of the reasons that, uh, that wind energy has almost doubled in cost uh, in this decade. But you also can see that uh, China and uh, India, Two enormously growing economies are now taking wind seriously, and of course we need that if we have a chance to have an impact on global climate change. Well, even with that growth, and now that we're number one, we still ha only supply about 2% of our nation's energy with wind energy. So we have a long ways to go, and I'm going to show you in a few minutes a report that we issued this year. Uh, that we believe, the Department of Energy, American Energy Association, the industry, we worked 18 months to say, what do we think uh, 
this nation could come to as far as percentage of wind. And we think it can easily, when I say easily, not easily for the utility, uh, because there's lots of work to do, be done in integrating a variable resource, uh, get to 20% energy by 2030. And if we develop some storage technologies that our, our colleague from EPRI will talk about, uh, we believe we can get well beyond that, especially with electric, ve electric uh, hybrid vehicles. Now, th this is a little bit complicated, but this is an important one, especially here in, in, uh, in, the, in gas country. Uh, this just shows the percentage of the new generation that was installed by source. And those blue colors are natural gas. And you can see that natural gas was the dominant new uh, generation source uh, this decade and in the late 90s. But that green is wind. And you can see uh, in 2007, about 35% of the new generation across the country was installed by wind. In 2008, it was 42%. That means wind is here, and wind is a serious new uh, competitive generation source that the utilities are now, and Excel in particular, uh, are embracing as an important part of their portfolio. And I emphasize part of their portfolio. Uh, I'm not here to tell you that wind is the answer, because I don't think there is a single answer. We need all uh, clean generation sources, and we need to look the technology to clean up the ones that aren't as clean. So wind is now a mainstream energy technology. Now this shows the sort of the history of the cost of wind. And as you can see, back around 2000, it sort of hit its low. And there was a project in Lamar, Colorado, in southeastern Colorado, uh, that XL buys, um, that was, came in around 3.3 cents a kilowatt hour. But now you can see there were forces, three, three major forces that actually started the prices going up to almost double the installed capacity uh, cost from about $1,000 a kilowatt, a million dollars a megawatt, to almost $2,000 a kilowatt. I mentioned the euro dollar ratio. That's a big one because we were importing a lot of our equipment from Europe. There also was a lot of supply and demand tightness because wind was picking up very dramatically and yet the manufacturing hadn't picked up accordingly and so we had a situation where supply and demand got very tight and that allows suppliers to raise prices. And thirdly, commodity costs. These turbines are made of fiberglass and steel. Uh, generators are made a lot of copper in them. All commodity prices were going up pretty dramatically. Construction costs are going up. But that's true of natural gas, uh, hardware, as well as um, conventional coal facilities. So all the costs were going up. When we did analysis back in the, uh, around 2000 and used wind as about a million dollars a megawatt, coal was about $1,200 a megawatt, now wind's more like $2 million a megawatt, but coal's also dramatically increased. Just the plant for maybe $1,800, even up to $3,000 a megawatt, depending on what the technology is. So all generation has gone up, and that will affect energy prices regardless of which energy form we're talking about. However, even with that, this blue line is basically the range of wholesale power prices um, for those years. And the red dots are the weighted average of contract prices for wind. And as you can see, on average across the country, wind was still a pretty good deal compared to what you could buy energy from the wholesale market from. However, if you look at it regionally, it dra changes dramatically. Um, the legend, the, uh, my eyes are, also are bad, but so, so is this screen. In the heartland and in Texas, those left-hand ones, you can see that the red line is the weighted average of contract prices in those two regions, and the, the, those blue boxes are the wholesale prices. As you can see, this is, partly explains why the wind rush in West Texas, because it's dramatically lower than the wholesale prices, and therefore it's good for the utilities, it's good for the developers, it's good for the landowners. On the left-hand side there, you can see at the turn of the century, when Wind Powering America uh, was launched by your now governor, who was then Secretary of Energy, Richardson, uh, there were really only four states, uh, Minnesota, Iowa, California, and Texas took wind seriously. Now there are over 23 states that have significant amounts of wind installed. And as I project out to the year 2030, and you'll see that in a, mi in a minute, 
44 states will have a significant amount of wind installed if decisions are made on wind installations based on economics. And we know that that's only part of the, of the issue. There's an old expression that engineers like myself uh, with, their, with their computers can determine what can happen. Economists uh, with their with sharp uh, pencils and, and, and eye shades can determine what should happen, but it's politics and politicians and policy that determines what will happen. And that's why it's important that you have Senator Bingham in common, you had a representative this morning. These are folks who are determining policy, and policy has a very critical role uh, in the future of all uh, energy forms. So you can see there's a tr been a transformation just in the last decade of wind energy across this nation. Lots of drivers for wind energy. It's not just one thing that's making it happen. Of course, being economical and cost competitive with our generation sources is absolutely critical that we have uh, wind um, at par with other generation. Fuel price uncertainty has driven a lot of this. Uh, if you've, well, you guys know this because you're from, you know, Gas Patch USA. But uh, natural gas, which was the, again, installed more than any other generation source by far in the last decade, natural gas prices is is sort of the um, symbol for volatility in, in fuel price. And trying to project out what the fuel price is going to be 10 to 20 years from now is, a, is an impossibility, and therefore that's risk associated with that choice. As I mentioned, policies are important. In the federal policy, we have something called a production tax credit, which, is, which is, has been, up to this year, critical in uh, incentivizing those who develop projects because the production tax credit, about two cents a kilowatt hour, in a good windy resource like West Texas could be 40 percent of the revenue for the first 10 years of that project. And we had a situation where we were on again, off again, on again, off again, uh, because it's basically developed by Congress, and now we finally got an extension of three years. The problem is, this year there are not a lot of companies who can take advantage of a production tax credit. So there's other policies being developed, guaranteed loans from the Department of Energy, uh, some investment tax credits, um, grants in lieu of uh, the production tax credit are all being considered right now as far as the rules. Uh, and what, and that'll be, they'll be very important to get those defined because not a lot's happening right now on wind energy development until those rules are, and uh, regulations are defined. Um, state policies are very important. You, you have an RPS here. Texas has an RPS. How many people are here from Texas, by the way? Okay, so I can tell some jokes, not that many of them. <laughs> Um, Texas actually uh, developed sort of the model RPS when they deregulated. And it was very interesting because the head of the Public Utility Commission, who then became, became head of FERC under uh, Bush II, uh, Pat Wood, did what they call deliberative polling around all the utilities in Texas, where they actually educated the people in all different generation sources and answered their questions, and then asked them what would they prefer. And, and Pat Wood said it was almost a religious experience that here in, in Gas Patch USA, these people would prefer renewable energy and efficiency. And he said, well, that's what you prefer. We're going to give it to you, uh, and, and we're going to uh, basically put the costs in the rate base. And so you have a model RPS over in Texas, uh, and we now have RPSs in, uh, in 28 states across the country, but Texas was the one who actually led the way with a... Do we lose the picture? No? Okay, I'm sorry. I hate to look down there and see myself. That's a, that's a scary, scary situation. But it is out of focus, so it's not as bad as it actually is. Um, economic development, one of the big drivers in rural America. You don't put these wind turbines in Dallas or in Houston, uh, or in Santa Fe or Albuquerque, you put them in the plains. And it's a very interesting urban-rural partnership because, especially in the West here, we're more urbanized in the West than we are in the, U in the rest of the U.S. Most of our population lives in the cities, and that's where the energy is used and paid for. And yet we develop these wind turbines in the rural areas, and they get the jobs, they get the economic development benefits of land payments, and, and taxes. So economic development is a huge driver, and I'll show you some of the numbers that we've calculated for, uh, for New Mexico as far as uh, what it could be. Public support, poll after poll after poll, uh, sort of replicates what happened in Texas as far as people preferring uh, renewable energy, and wind being the lowest cost and most competitive, wind wins in many of those cases, certainly here uh, in, in the Southwest. 
Green power is a way of getting wind started. That's the way it got started in Colorado. Uh, there was sort of a challenge to the, to the utility public service of Colorado that if we put wind in, uh, uh, the advocate said, and get people to pay a premium, would you build it? If we got people to buy it. And the utility said, sure, but people aren't really going to pay a premium for a commodity. Uh, you know, this is electricity. And they said, well, if we get people to sign up, will you do it? And they said, sure. So they started with five megawatts, signed more people up, 22 megawatts, went to 66 megawatts. In Colorado now, we have four, over 40,000 people saying we're willing to pay a little premium for wind. But the premium is very small now uh, because of natural gas prices uh, and their volatility. We have now over 400 utilities around the country that offer a, a green power program so people can have a choice of signing up for, uh, for a a little bit extra money uh, for green power. So it's a, it's a starter. It's not the ultimate, but it's a starter. Energy security, of course, that's a, a, a big issue. Uh, this is homegrown energy. This is on the farm. This is in our backyards. This is renewable. Uh, you know, the, the future, and it still may be the future, although with this new, these new developments in, uh, in gas, um, shale that sound really exciting as far as homegrown uh, resources. LNG was being projected as something that uh, was going to be the future of natural gas. And of course, we use natural gas for fertilizer, for heating and cooling our homes, for a lot of industrial feedstocks. Natural gas is a critical resource for our country for a lot of reasons. And so, so when the wind blows, you save natural gas on your system because the operator backs off the highest cost resource. So when your wind's blowing, natural gas is backed off and that saves customers money, but it also saves us from depleting our natural gas resources. So energy security is a big issue, and wind, we think, is part of the solution. And then lastly, carbon risk. I think you're going to hear more about carbon risk today, uh, cap and trade, carbon tax, uh, whichever the, whatever the rules are, um, remember that wind and renewables are carbon free, and therefore that they're, again, part of the solution. There's a wedge analysis that was developed and promulgated by the folks at, at Princeton, and wind is a very big piece of that wedge uh, for the U.S. Again, not completely solving the rich issue, but having a big uh, impact. Uh, th this, uh, again, shows that competitiveness. The gray area is basically the operating cost of a natural gas uh, combined cycle turbine, uh, showing the, the fluctuations in fuel price during those years. The green line is the uh, contract price, weighted contract price for wind projects, and then uh, the blue was that, uh, remember the commodity uh, price we talked about as far as wholesale prices on the marketplace. And as you can see, wind uh, continues to be a, a good deal. But there's a good combination here of wind and natural gas, because natural gas can ramp up and down, follows low very nicely, and therefore it's a nice combination of wind and natural gas uh, as far as load following. There's the resource on the left, and you can see the Great Plains, the wind that blows across the Great Plains every day could supply three times the energy of our nation. Now that's not going to happen because you can't run the nation on, uh, uh, on a variable resource. But I'm just telling you that's the resource, the, 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 the enormity of the resource. In uh, New Mexico alone, uh, you have about 300,000 megawatts of uh, wind resource, of developable wind resource. Now, you're not going to develop all that because if you did, that would be, a, uh, be an enormous resource to try to handle in a small part of the country. But it's an enormous resource. You've developed about 500 megawatts, uh, and that's less than two-tenths of 1% of your resource. So you have an enormous wind resource, and Texas is even greater. Texas is on the order of 700,000 megawatts. So you have an enormous wind resource in this, in this area, so you're not resource limited when it comes to wind. But that other graph on the right-hand side is USGS saying, here is the, um, the population, the, the census. And the, all those counties in the dark are counties that are losing population. And look at the coincidence of the great wind resource and where they need economic development to keep those populations and those communities uh, vital. And so in West Texas, uh, which was depleting its natural gas, and lots of towns were, uh, were drying up, wind has now come in and basically revitalized many towns in West Texas, as well as across the country. We went to the first project in South Dakota. The mayor of that town 
uh, got all choked up because that project basically saved that town by uh, bringing in tax revenues, but more importantly, providing uh, well, good paying forty to $60,000 jobs uh, for operators uh, that would raise their families in that town. A 500 megawatt wind project uh, might have uh, 30 to 50 operators uh, that would raise their families in that town. These are long-term jobs. So rural America revitalization, we think wind is one of the main opportunities. Okay, New Mexico, we, we just did this 1,000 megawatt number. We think like, that's a nice round number that everybody can sort of put their hands around. Uh, what would the, be the impact and, uh, of 1,000 megawatts developed in New Mexico? Remember, you have about half of that right now uh, in all those different areas. Payments to landowners. In Mex New Mexico is payment in lieu of taxes because of your uh, tax situation. Um, as well as construction jobs, lots of construction jobs, but you can build a, a wind plant uh, in six to nine months. It's not going to be something that's going to have a long-term benefit to that community. It was, it's an inrush of, uh, of, fun, of uh, capital and, and cash flow, but long-term, you're looking for the operating jobs. But it would have on the order of 250 long-term uh, jobs, 1,000 megawatts, of all kinds of jobs associated with that operation uh, and maintenance. But then you have, as you spend that money in local community, you have something called the multiplier effect that the economists uh, use all the time. This is an input-output in, input analysis. And that impact is almost as much as a direct impact. So total, we're talking about almost 500 additional jobs for that 1,000 megawatts. And you guys are halfway there. Okay, there's the New Mexico wind map. You can see that uh, Hobbs is on that map, down there on the right-hand corner. Um, well, you guys know that. I mean, that was, that was news to me, but, that, but that, you guys know all that about that. But you see that whole eastern part of New Mexico has a pretty uh, good resource. And it was said this morning about the transmission issue, and that's one of the big challenges for getting the resource uh, to the load centers. There's a transmission proposal. If you look at the countrywide, it comes from eastern Montana through eastern Wyoming, through eastern Colorado, eastern New Mexico, and then it goes across to the growth centers of, of Phoenix, Las Vegas and Southern California that collects basically the great resource uh, of, the, uh, of the Great Plains and feeds it to the load centers. That takes a lot of work. We aren't used to working together state to state. We have you know, national policies and state policies, but when we talk about interstate uh, on transmission, it gets pretty challenging. Now, in natural gas, you have FERC who, who basically permits and sets up the lines. You don't have that in transmission, and that's something the West is really challenged with, and we're going to solve that problem uh, if we're going to really uh, capture the great resources of, our, of, our, uh, of the West and feed them into the load centers. How am I doing? Pretty good? Because I'm just getting done my introduction here uh, to, the, to the, the big story. Um, Excuse me. Uh, this is a case study of their first project in New Mexico, 200 megawatt uh, project. Uh, I highlighted just one area, and that's this almost half a million dollars a year in payment to, uh, uh, in lieu of taxes to the local communities. One of the big transformations that's occurring uh, in the last couple of years and will continue to occur is the, is the idea of getting the manufacturing back to the U.S. As I mentioned, uh, we were buying a lot of equipment from Denmark and Spain and Germany. Uh, but just in the last two years, uh, 50 major manufacturing facilities have been uh, developed uh, or announced. And you can see where the locations are. They, they're developing these in the wind development regions. I mean, these blades now are 130, 140 feet long. And so they're, you know, driving these, these babies around uh, from Louisiana, shipping them into, into New Orleans and driving them up to North Dakota costs a lot of money. These towers are 250 feet tall in three sections, and these are huge pieces of equipment. Transportation costs in the Dakotas got to about 10% of the whole project cost. And so, you, as you can see, in that region of Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, one of the real development belts, Iowa and, and Minnesota have over 1,000 megawatts developed, lots of installations. And then in the Colorado, uh, Oklahoma, Texas region, where a lot of wind is being developed, 
another hotbed of manufacturing. We can, and we see this continuing. And manufacturing uh, is really the uh, coup de grace for a governor to, to bring in a manufacturing facility. Lots of high quality, long term uh, uh, jobs in manufacturing of wind turbines. Lots of environmental benefits, uh, socks and knocks, precursors to acid rain. Does that mean two minutes? Okay, um, let's go into the, into the Evelyn Wood speed reading here. Um, no water, that's, that's one of the big environmental benefits. This shows you the counties in red and yellow and, and orange that are, uh, that are stressed, that have non-sustainable water withdrawals. And you can see the Ogallala Aquifer there uh, that's in big trouble. Uh, this is what the climate change folks are saying uh, the future may hold. Uh, temperatures increasing uh, up to four to five degrees. And more importantly, this is the water impact. This is the increase in evapotranspiration. And you can see New Mexico, West Texas, the Southwest, we're talking about 30 to 35 percent greater evapotranspiration in the future. Less water available for a growing population and growing needs. Lots of issues associated with wind power. I'm not going to get into all those. I want to get to this 20 percent. Transmission being a big one. Integrating large quantities of variable resource, another one which the utilities, I think, are doing a great job on and continue to need to do a great job on. Uh, this is uh, one of my philosophers. Uh, the future ain't what it used to be. This is our 20 percent report, which I, I, uh, is on the 20 percent dot, uh, dot org. Uh, you can read the whole thing. but. This is, the, this is our resource in our country. Uh, and it shows that we have on the order of 600,000 uh, megawatts of, of wind. Remember, the, the installed capacity in our country is about uh, a terawatt of generation. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's uh, this is, this is in, in gigawatts, that's 1,000 gigawatts, okay? So, you can see that we have a, a great uh, amount of generation uh, available for wind. Um, that's not right. 100 gigawatts. My every friend's right there. He's going to help me with this one. Uh, so we have we have about six times the the, the resource that we need, uh, but we're not going to use all that, obviously. Um, so the blue is offshore. Now you in New Mexico don't have to worry about that, at least for a while. Uh, the folks in Texas are looking at the Gulf. Uh, as a potential offshore development, of course, people on the East Coast. This is the this is the nirvana because a lot of people live on the East Coast. They pay a lot of they pay a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, their revenue for for energy prices that, that range anywhere from 12 to 16 cents a kilowatt hour. Very high cost, uh, and you have a great wind resource. We have a great wind resource off the East Coast of our country. And so they're developing offshore in Europe very rapidly. We're going to learn from their. Uh, their experiences, and so in a 20% future, uh, there'll probably be 50 gigawatts or so of offshore in the Great Lakes and, and, and in the, uh, off the coast. This is the, our model, what it says, as far as the future, uh, what might be if the economists make all the decisions, and we hope they don't. Uh, but you can see that, that Texas, Oklahoma, uh, and New Mexico uh, get a lot of wind, and uh, New Mexico is in the order of almost 7,000 megawatts, Texas in the 20,000 megawatts. So between the two of you, uh, you get a lot of wind in that economic model. This is the transmission that needs to be built. The red, red lines or the transmission needs to be built. A lot of transmission is required. But transmission is only about 10% of the cost of the whole uh, kit and caboodle. Two scenarios, no wind and 20% wind. Uh, the difference um, is about 2% of the investment we need because we need about, about $2.3 trillion to meet the load uh, by 2030. I'm almost done. This is the mix. On the left-hand side is no wind. On the right-hand side with the green is the wind piece. You can see it's only 20 percent, but it's a significant difference than business as usual. This is the, this is the carbon footprint of the, of the electricity generation industry. You can see the blue line would be business as usual with uh, out a lot of wind. The green line is where we have to get to to stabilize the, the, uh, the climate. The yellow line is the line of the 20% wind scenario. So you can see that a 20% wind scenario almost flattens the carbon footprint of the electricity industry, even with a pretty aggressive growth scenario. So in New Mexico, from an economic development standpoint, we're talking about $7.3 billion if you build out that 7,000 megawatts and over 3,000 long-term jobs. Nationally, we're talking about uh, 1.4 uh, 
um, billion, I'm sorry, you know, 1.4 1, 1. trillion dollars of economic development and all, over 3 million jobs. I want to get to this, this is just right near the end. This is the water savings. When you don't build coal plants, coal plants use between 400 and 600 gallons, consume 400 and 600 gallons of water per megawatt hour. If you don't build some of those, if you back off natural gas, which uses about half of that water consumed, you save about 4 trillion gallons of water, which can be used for other things, irrigation, municipal water supply. And you can see Texas, Oklahoma, uh, New Mexico, we save almost a trillion of that, of that 4 trillion nationally. So that's one of the big benefits that people don't think about much, but it's critical to the future of the Southwest. So we spend a little bit about $43 billion more than we would alternatively, but that doesn't include any carbon tax. That includes no uh, benefits for gas savings. Net, we save about $2 billion, $200 billion in that scenario. So sorry for that uh, rapid reading at the end. This is all on the website. Uh, we have a great potential future here in New Mexico and in West Texas to help secure our nation with a clean and renewable energy source. Thank you for your attention.